Thank you and welcome to everyone uh, across Australia. I see we've got people from as far afield as Roselle um, and uh, Melbourne. And last uh, month we had uh, someone from Brisbane and Perth and Melbourne. So we've got quite a, a reach. It's uh, great to see the ability that we have now to uh, engage people from Cairns to Perth. We want to be able to build that. So all of you that are watching this, if you have uh, people who are friends um, and colleagues that are interested in what we're doing here, please go online and go to the website and uh, there you'll see uh, you can subscribe for no cost and we want to build a network and uh, run many more of these events. It's amazing actually how uh, COVID-19 has changed us all. Um, I was just thinking the other day there, I haven't shaken anyone's hand for a few months and we see some people proffering their hand and you immediately back away like they've got COVID-19. Well, they could have. Uh, the other thing is we see people walking down the footpath and suddenly swerve to one side. It really is changing the way we live. Uh, and the third one, of course, is working from home, which we're all doing. And it's making a big difference to a lot of people. There's a fellow the other day who was, uh, worked for an American uh, computer company. And I said to Adam, I said, uh, when will you be going back to work? And he said, well, it could be indefinite. He said, uh, we've been told not to return because by the time we get into the city and get escorted up to the 26th floor and uh, down again and separated through the day, it's just really not worth it. And so he sees himself working from home indefinitely. So what that's going to do to work relationships, to real estate values, uh, who knows? But we can actually talk a little bit about some of those things as well today. So Hugh, Toby, Josh and Angus, thanks very much for setting this up. And I'm really looking forward to this afternoon. And as uh, Hugh said, let us know where you are because we want to spread the word and spread our reach. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you, Graham. And uh, I'm just trying to get the, uh, the chat function up so I can see who we've got. So I know you said someone from Roselle. Do we have, well, we've we got, we got Fitzroy North, Melbourne, Sydney, La Perouse, Central Coast. It's great to see a bit of regional Australia. I keep talking to the team here about uh, getting more regional Australia uh, involved. So that's fantastic. Dulwich Hill. Fantastic. So we've got a few people from Sydney as we usually do, but also from a bit further afield. So that's fantastic. So without further ado, I'll, I'll dive right in. So um, Toby and Joshua, make sure you're unmuted. Um, but um, the first question to be posed to you is really, how might we engage with public health in Australia post COVID-19? So we know we hear about a lot in the news about how um, how it's impacting health systems around the world. And I think it's, Australia's probably been lucky compared to some countries. And we've seen, you know, what it's like in some of the hospitals around the world during uh, COVID-19. But uh, how might we engage with public health in Australia post COVID-19? What are your thoughts? Um, well, hello, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. It's exciting to be doing my first webinar. It's uh, certainly good to be doing something in a slightly different format. Um, I guess I've been thinking about this a lot because Josh and I sort of started to write these questions with the other support from the committee just to throw these ideas around what was, uh, I guess, poignant to the population at the moment. And I've spent a lot of time over the last week especially thinking about it and thinking what is actually public health. And every one of us has had a very diverse definition of what it is. So what I thought I might do is define what public health means to me. And this is from my learnings through studies and my practice working overseas, and I guess here in Australia as well. To me, public health is really about uh, a framework that provides, you know, health is at its centre, both physical and mental health. But what I find is really important to me is always stuck with me is that, that it's, you know, made up of your... Um, you know, economics, it's made up of your social structures, you know, your community, it's made up with people having purpose, you know, education and, and many other aspects. It's not a singular, just health is one thing. So what, what I found, what I, why I use that, whenever I've worked overseas with say Doctors Without Borders or Medicine Sans Frontier, I mean, one of the 
maybe best examples I, I've been thinking about was that musculoskeletal pain, um, this was in Bangladesh when I was there working in the Rohingya refugee camp, musculoskeletal pain in adults was one of the highest incidents um, of, of, of diseases that we saw because we would categorize them. And often you knew that the, the, it wasn't a pain that they'd had because they'd injured it, it was often a somatic pain, meaning it was probably from mental health related sort of consequences. But the actual attributing factor of that was that they've lost their livelihood, they're in a refugee camp, they've lost family members, and it's been a year since they've been largely forced from their properties. You know, they, they have no economic ability to move on. And, you know, by giving out, well, Medicine for Some Fonts, did, you know, the best they can and had mental health support services and would offer that. And, you know, I th thought did a really good job in the, in the circumstances. It, it was, sometimes it was more of a band-aid than what really was systemically the issue, which was obviously the, in the refugee camp and, you know, people being stuck in that, that circumstance. So I think coming back to COVID and how to engage with public health, I think it's, you know, this is going to cause or has caused massive social change. Hugh, you mentioned in your opening comments, some people might not be even going back to work. So I think looking at putting public health in the centre of that, how do we then figure out, you know, what might a particular intervention do on someone's particular physical health and mental health? And I think that's where we can engage with public health and use it as a framework for us going forward, really. Right. And so when we talk about engaging with public health, what are some examples of that? Uh, the types of, you know, when we talk about engagement, it's a broad ranging word. What do we, what do we mean by that? Well, I mean, I think everything that we do should have a, a bit more of a critical lens. You know, I, I, work, I, I, I don't like to work in silos and, you know, from coming up, growing in nursing, you, you very much work within your silo in many respects. You have your clinical pathways, your guidelines, um, but out, when you get thrown into a, you know, a circumstance like where I'm at now at CareFlight, while medically the patients are quite well, I've suddenly now got rain, I've got aircraft um, you know, considerations to worry about. There's all these other things that impact upon that are medical and that's what I'm really trying to say. It's, it's, it's a framework helping you, you know, solve that, I guess, medical-based human need of well-being, which is really what I boil it down to. If someone's well-being is, is, is good, then chances are they have a good mix of, you know, social purpose, um, mental health, well, you know, physical health, all these aspects are made into one. So when you, I guess, do that from a, looking at, you know, how I work, if I just knew really, really well about medicine, I would really struggle in the back of a plane because I'm the sole practitioner at 25,000 feet. There's very little I can rely on apart from what's in the plane around me. You know, there is a sat phone where I can call someone, but, you know, if, if there's a break in the set, you know, I've really got to be the prepared and ready for that. And that's, what I mean, really looking and engaging what are the possibilities. And that's why I think how we should engage with public health going forward, not just as a, it will help us through the um, contact tracing, the swabbing, but look at it as a broader mechanism to push all the interventions and things we need to do going forward with, with value and purpose. Mm. And that's interesting. What you touch on there and your experience for going into, I think it was care flight, you know, being in the back of a plane. And I imagine a lot of our health professionals, are, you know, there's a whole bunch of new skill sets even and behaviours and habits they have to adopt uh, to manage post-COVID-19 post as well. Um, Joshua, do you have a, an answer to this question as well? How, how do you think, how do you see this changing from your perspective, um, you know, looking at the World Health Organisation policy and at the policy end of things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, uh, from my end, thank you all for, for being here. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you about an area that is just so exciting. <laughs> from, from my perspective, um, we, uh, it's been incredible watching, you know, the lecture slides that I have, that I studied at, at university about worst case scenario being thrown out the window <laughs> and us needing to restart and, and learn about, um, you know, with how really we manage to engage in, in the public health um, sector. Um, because of an issue that is just so unprecedented. Um, the first thing that, that struck me um, upon you know, trying to break down this question is that, uh, as Toby said, it's going to be uh, you know, maintaining a, a clear definition of public health and its effects on us uh, is, is critical. Um, a new and dynamic form of engagement in the sector has already begun since day one and you know, 
um, in the month in the, the days and months leading up to the pandemic had begun. Um, COVID-19 has catalyzed uh, a health system facelift globally, um, led by prominent budget changes. Firstly, um, in Australian set, in Australia's case, we've had a $2.4 billion health package being delivered as a direct result of the, um, of the pandemic. Um, 669 million of that amount is actually going to, to uh, Medicare subsidized telehealth services. So we are going online, we are going over the phone, we are going to, to, to um, citizens' doors. That's the first, um, a first change in engagement with this. We're, we're seeing that face-to-face -face interactions from now uh, will change and will most, most likely never go back to how they were before, um, before COVID-19. Um, that's important to note because um, when considering you know, the national well-being, um, well-being and mental health um, uh, considerations, that's, that this is going to um, have an effect in that area of health as well. You pull one string and, another, and, and there's, there's, it's a push and pull situation um, that we need to be considering here. In fact, the, the Black Dog Institute recently um, produced a paper suggesting that individuals with existing mental health problems, um, including healthcare workers, um, those who are actually infected with the, with the disease, um, for those in quarantine and those who have become unemployed, I mean, all these vulnerable, um, vulnerable groups have been known to um, have an increased risk of experiencing anxiety or, or mental illness and, or distress. So um, in terms of how we engage with the, with the sector, there's going to need to be uh, a, a response plan. There is in fact one, and there, it has, um, there has been um, increased funding in, in that area. So that's, that's how, in, in, when engaging, it's going to play a more prominent role, I think. Um, in addition, we're going to tracing the, um, tracing coronavirus cases is going to become the norm. Until we have a vaccine, um, I, um, you know, concepts and initiatives such as the COVID Safe app, um, as well as you know, taking numbers and uh, at all uh, meetings over 20 people, um, practices, social practices like, like that are going to become the norm. They will not become strange. Um, and other items, you know, the way that we engage with, with, with medicine, um, there, there will be limits on prescriptions and over-the-counter medications to ensure those who need them can access them. These are the things that you know, we need to be thinking about. Um, in addition, community engagement uh, is, is huge. Um, we have huge lessons to make um, moving forward on how we should have engaged with the community um, on a deeper and more substantial level. A recent study from, the, uh, from Ukraine recently was, um, released data suggesting that their positive health outcomes could only have been improved if through increased community engagement to help shape policy. Because after all, being told to stay at home, I mean, it's, it's been tough for all of us. And I think that uh, if we had had more of a say in the process, um, would, would have made a difference in um, higher rates of compliance. Having said that, we, um, Australians did an amazing job. So uh, it's perhaps some other countries that I won't mention yet at the moment who could have, could have had, um, benefited from. Finally, um, something of note, um, as the pandemic, I think, settles and, res and, and resurgences decrease, either by better control or successful implementation of a vaccine, we're going to have to reface the significant uh, you know, public health challenges relating to climate change, <laughs> that, that, that old subject. You know? um, the Australian Medical Journal recently declared climate change a health emergency in September 2019. I mean, little did we know that you know, one more significant was just around the corner, but it is, but it will be something that we have to come back and, um, and you know, seriously think about. Um, so, I mean, we do have, you know, for example, in New South Wales, we have, um, there have been steps taken in educating um, you know, the public on how climate change can affect your health. Um, it is completely holistic. Uh, and so that, that's, but, uh, you know, we can go further. The Queensland government have developed a human health and wellbeing climate change adaption plan. So getting back into um, climate change as uh, becoming a significant issue, is something that I also see will, will change the way we engage with the sector uh, in the coming months and years. Mm. Yeah, something comes to mind there, when we, you we, we touched on how people sort of maybe visit the doctor, and I know there's been some, and it, some investment in telehealth and things like that. Is that something we can expect to see more of for our everyday uh, health visits, just because we're maybe learning that it's actually quite efficient and it's not just for when we're social distancing, but it can be actually pretty effective on its own. Is that something you expect to see more of like if i have a sniffly nose one morning rather than going up to my gp and spreading it around there i can i can log on and get some help somewhere or via phone to to get diagnosed based on my symptoms or um or told whether it's it's, it's urgent or not is that something you think you'll see more of 
Yeah, absolutely. It was already there. There was already traction in that um, in, in initiatives. So for example, one three sick um, was an initiative that was already um, taking off the ground, um, and it was proving to have successful health outcomes in minimizing communicable um, disease transfer. You know, in those medical centers and hospitals, um, and resource allocation, um, closing down. You know, minimizing uh, uh, visitors to the ER and and um, is something that and, and the ed as something that uh i think toby may be able to will be able to comment on but it's uh, yeah it's something that i think is absolutely of an advantage to us and it's just being catalyzed significantly by by covid right thanks chap so i'll ask you the second question then and our formal questions here um the question is what do you think are the residual effects of covid19 on australian society so we're obviously, we talked a little bit about how we engage with public health, but I think we're all thinking about this question at the moment, and we're certainly thinking about it from a, a business perspective or a corporate world perspective and you know, how we get our jobs done. And um, what are your thoughts on what are those residual effects on Australian society of this pandemic? Um, I mean, I can start if you want. I think there are uh, going to be many, I guess, winners and losers to this. I think there, you know, like any major change, there's always going to be, um, you know, new opportunities opening up. And I've certainly seen that. I mean, I didn't think I'd be on a cruise ship in Western Australia, you know, working on, with COVID and being able to see all around the cruise ship. And, you know, that, that was an absolute pleasure to work with the Ausmat team. I, I really enjoyed the experience. And it was a, you know, I you know to see, what what can happen in the middle of a pandemic and and how a, a state and federal government you know address the dire issue um and i certainly know i don't want to be on a cruise ship anytime soon not with uh easy outbreaks like that but i think coming more close to home in the medical field i've seen it it's, it's been really interesting that the the gp and medical services that have been able to adapt have done well um i, I work at wise respiratory clinic and that certainly was just set up at the start of this pandemic by um wise specialist emergency it's a walk-in private emergency and that they saw you know a big drop in their regular patients because everyone was staying at home so they you know adapted and saw well there's a need now and moved into doing uh, gp based sort of uh, respiratory uh, testing and and also um, consultations which is you know has been great for them it, it, it's really helped them so and then, but then I know a lot of other GPs that they just haven't, you know, they've either been refusing patients because they don't want to get sick because they don't have the PPE, you know, which has been seen a lot around the world, or they, you know, have really struggled. And, uh, you know, I've heard, I've heard people that have uh, potentially GPs and other things that are going out of business or certainly really struggling. You know, I guess I've always had this mindset of being prepared ever since I've started working in emergency, you know, seven, eight years ago. And it's all around what might happen and being prepared for what might happen. And going back to the care flight, that's what we do. We train, you know, the majority of patients we move are, are generally well, they're into hospital transfers, but we're there for what might happen. Our kit represents what might happen when you have to do something. So it's always that mindset of being prepared, which I think is something that, we potentially, if, we, if us as Australia can move into that and take that mindset going forward, I think we'll do well. You know, speaking about our last webinar, our first one is Reinvent Australia by Paul Hodgson, looking at re um, renewable energy and where are the benefits of that. I think that's a perfect time to be making these conversations. And I think this is one of the real positive things that can come out of COVID is, you know, looking at how we can manufacture certain things in Australia. And I know that's a certain interest point for many people in the committee and, and I know a lot of people I've spoken to, they want Australian made, but you obviously still have to do that when the balance, we can't just suddenly go from zero to a hundred and as, as an economy and, you know, move into manufacturing. But I think it's an important thing we should start to look at. And then I guess you can flip and some of the things that I worry about sort of more long-term is, you know, there's been discussions around domestic violence being a growing, um, a growing trend because people are stuck inside, you know, it's, it's less less so now, but previously in the last couple of months, and I worry about what that might that effects it might have on the children that have been ex exposed to this, while not directly at them having the circumstances in and around that. You know, that's the thing that childhood is obviously a very important thing. And so, 
what I find interesting is what might the mental health outcomes be in sort of 10 or 15 years when these children grow up. And that's often, you know, there's a big correlation between childhood trauma and, you know, greater risk of predisposed mental health later in life. So I think, you know, COVID may obviously have a lot of economic and um, financial and, and, you know, social and all these other changes happening at the moment. But I think there will be many things in the years to come that we won't necessarily see, but probably will be able to be traced back to this pandemic. Um, but also look at the history of the Spanish flu uh, in, you know, was it 19, sort of 17, 16, 18? Um, you know, I, I saw, I was looking at some photos and they had exactly the same churches were closed, you know, no gatherings, no more attendance. It's probably because it's so long ago that we don't have the, the, institutional memory to remember all, but it's not so much different at the same time with with what, what we've done before. It's just been a long time ago. So yeah, I think there'll be certainly residual effects, some closer, some other, and I think there'll certainly be, be some you know, really big opportunities coming out of this. Yeah, it's interesting. Hopefully we're, hopefully the, our governments have got a, a clear playbook on how to manage a pandemic going forward because I heard a, a pandemic expert recently on a podcast saying that uh, we, it, this is actually a, a pretty relatively minor pandemic and that there could be far worse. And if we think, I think he referred to, I think it was the avian influenza, which was, I think, a 60% death rate, but it was nowhere near as contagious as, as the coronavirus. Um, but if in future, in the next, say, 50 years, there was a, a pathogen which was as contagious as the coronavirus, but I had a 60% death rate. We want to be really ready for that. And so hopefully this is a kind of an effective dress for her or if something like that happens and hopefully it doesn't. And interesting, Toby, you mentioned um, one of the societal effects being, you know, being cooped up and an impact even to domestic violence. I recently, uh, this week actually, I had to call a, a locksmith because I managed to snap a key off in my garage door. So I had to a uh, locksmith came around. My wife was talking to the locksmith and apparently the locksmith said that they've been very busy lately because um, it's very, quite troubling. But uh, whenever there's a, a spike in domestic violence, more people get their locks changed. And yeah, wow. there's been a lot of business for locksmiths as a result of that. So it was interesting to hear them say that as a result of these domestic violence increases that they've um, had a spike in their business. So it's funny you see these sort of metrics and indicators of those types of things which are happening. Yeah, Joshua, so, so, I, I think certainly it's like, you know, you wouldn't expect locks bis businesses to be going up and the medical world to be sort of drawing down in some respects. And, and that was some, you know, things that have taken me, taken me by surprise. And I think that's one thing we need to be careful of is, like I said, be prepared because we don't know what's happening next. So I think this has been a huge example of, mm. we don't know. <laughs> yeah. And Joshua, we had uh, one, one of our, uh, participants here on the call was keen to hear more about uh, of your perspective on the kind of mental health impacts. You sort of touched on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, but what are some of the, the things you're hearing and seeing around the mental health impacts on us Australian society as a result of the pandemic, whether it's fear or the actual social distancing, the, our response to the pandemic itself? What are you seeing? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That, um, that is actually works in conjunction with a part of my answer to this question, which is fear of the unknown um i think perhaps adding to the the fuel of you know me mental health distress during such times um the stats are only now beginning to emerge but as i understand a colleague of mine at lifeline has mentioned that they have received approximately a 60 percent increase in phone calls um across the spectrum of of mostly uh, you know stress worry anxiety in relation to not just covid 19 but you know the the, the host of of side effects you know unemployment uh, financial insecurity, uh, personal worry of health and, and, um, and of um, health of their family and friends, and just just the how Australia can, you know, or, or their, their own communities can bounce back from such a profoundly impactful event. Um, that, that is now on the decrease, thankfully, as restrictions have now eased. Um, the, the concept of, of restriction, I mean, I know, I know individuals who, uh, especially, especially extroverted individuals, in nature who you know have have lost their um their capacity to engage in social settings um it does play a mental toll um and we've all we've all felt it um and it's something that i think is um although we'll will decrease in severity now it will act as uh, similar to a bell curve 
where uh, it will the, the effects will last for a long time for you know extended duration to come. Um, just touching on uh, what Toby mentioned, you know, he's he's mentioned all of the various societal aspects, and Hugh, you also mentioned um, the the concept of the disease uh, from that pandemic expert. Um, I would agree um, with with him or her that um, indeed this disease is neither uh, does not have a, a an R factor that is too high, as in that the the infection rate is not particularly high, and the death mortality rate isn't particularly high either. I have considered this disease. My colleagues and I have have been calling it a jack of all trades, but master of none. Um, it's pretty good at everything, <laughs> to, um, to put it in layman's terms, and that is why it has been successful in reaching, you know, that that pandemic state, but um, has not, you know, and you know, luckily, fortunately for us maintain that, that uh, mortality rate that is so high that is caused you know, complete devastation in every nation. Um, but um, getting back to the question, just uh, some thoughts that I had in regards to the residual effects, especially in the health, uh, in the health sector. I'm interested to know how communicable diseases, other communicable diseases, will drop as a result of prolonged social distancing and, uh, and better hygiene practices. Um, from you know, influen influenza, the common cold, even STIs, sexually transmitted infections, you know, uh, you know dates decreased, <laughs> Tinder dates decreased, <laughs> um, and uh, it's it's something that it, that is. Um, I'm interested to hear from um, the uh, the various sexual health clinics to see how their um, stats come out in the coming weeks and months. Um, domestic violence is something that I, that is of. Um, particular interest to public health adv um, advisors. We need to know, um, once again, stats should, should drive everything that we, all, all decisions that we make. It is seeming like there, that there, that there, has, um, there has been an increase, although further data is, is required. It's all circumstantial at this point. Uh, something else that a colleague of mine has mentioned is um, they would like to assess how literacy levels, obesity, and social skills of children will be affected as they lost school for so many, for so many weeks. Um, a crucial element of, of you know, the development. So that's something else that I'm interested in. Um, tribalism. This is a big one, especially because uh, of the novel nature of what we have experienced. Um, for, for those who don't know, tribalism is the concept of an individual receiving and taking opinions and uh, information from trusted sources as opposed to uh, reliable and professional resources. It's, we've, we've seen it in the anti-vaccine movement um, and unfortunately we have seen them spike since the release of, of, um, of COVID. We're now at the point where um, we're seeing, uh, especially through um, the World Health Organization, conspiracy theories involving Bill Gates, the 5G network disseminating um, the virus and you know Bill Gates uh, wanting to create this vaccine that microchips individuals. It's, it's getting to, to points like that now. Um, I myself have experienced quite a lot of, uh, of, of, of accusations relating to corruption and, and all, all that nonsense, which is, um, it, it is disheartening, uh, but at the same time, as long as I just keep doing my work and I don't have, and, and, and focusing on, you know, what is, um, what is really at stake here, um, it's quite, it's, you know, you just, you shake that off. But uh, it's important to, to keep this in mind because conspiracy prone thinkers endanger Australians. Um, you know, they spread misinformation and do not engage in recommended health practices such as vaccination. So um, I'll, be, I'll be curious to know what the uptake of the vaccine is. Um, as, as you can hear me say um, repeatedly, I'm curious to know because we don't have the information, the statistical data yet is still in the process of being released. And finally, once again, the question of, of the carbon footprint. A study in the prestigious Nature Journal actually mentioned that there was a decrease of 17% globally um, of our footprint. And a uh, residual effect would be how much of that reduction should, should, should include how much of that reduction can we sustain um, as we come out of lockdown and, um, and life slowly returns to normal. So yeah, those are just a few of my thoughts. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it seems like there's, there's these corollary benefits of our response yeah. to the pandemic. It, the, the big question I think is in everyone's lips at an individual level and as a societal economic level, how do we take those good things and sort of hang on to as much as possible as we can but also return to somewhat of a, a normal lifestyle and, and uh, work life and things like that. Mm. Um, Toby, you, you touched on something before and I just wanted to drive into it a bit more deeply. Is there, is there much um, 
is there much evidence out there that people who have been infected with COVID-19, even if they recover, they may be more susceptible to secondary health problems as a result of that? I know there's, there probably isn't a lot of reliable data necessarily that's been coming out in the media about that, but is there any indication that you've seen about that? Um, look, to be truthful, the only uh, positive cases I've actually seen have been in WA. Um, otherwise, even in health, I think at the Ride Respiratory Clinic, they've only had a, a couple of positive cases, you know, really early when they started. Otherwise, they haven't actually had any since, well, since they started. So COVID, you know, healthcare professionals actually coming in contact with COVID is very minimal in Australia. Uh, looking at the long-term benefits, I mean, sorry, long-term consequences and, and health, I, I'm not really sure. I think there are people that have, that I know there are doing studies on this. Um, how the media reports it, you know, I think it's stuff that should be known, but I kind of feel that it has the impact that it's probably going to scare more people than actually educate them in, in a respect. Um, I mean, it's good that it, in terms of that it probably will maybe stop a few people from doing high risk activities, you know, such as shaking hands, making sure they keep good hand hygiene, keeping social distancing. Um, but in terms of it, it's still too early to say what long term side effects COVID might have. Uh, I, I think Australia is not going to really know much about this. It's really going to be um, overseas that's going to have a much more uh, of an idea of what effect it might have on a population. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we're going to ask one more key question now, but if uh, just a reminder, everyone who's dialed in and who's attending today, feel free to enter your comments or enter your questions, sorry, in the Q&A function there um, or in the chat. Uh, I know some questions are coming through the chat, but if you use the Q&A, we'll hone in on those as well. Um, but just one last sort of formal question for Toby and Joshua. How do we balance the kind of the best practice with practicality? in a post COVID-19 world, we all know that there's kind of the ideal state and the ideal way of doing things then in the practical realities in a, in a complex um, implementation world uh, come into play. And how do you see that playing out in a post COVID-19 world or in the future from today even? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question, Hugh. It's something that I come across all the time in my job. Um, you know, I'll give you the best example is I, so I, you know, often when I go um, swabbing, uh, you know, for the COVID swabs, you might swab a mother who then, you know, during your uh, assessment, you find out has two kids and, you know, a husband and maybe, or well, maybe three kids. So by the, the rules that that mother should isolate, yet they all will, all cohabitate in the, in the same, same place. So for especially a mother who's, you know, maybe got a small child, you know, say under three months or six months, it's, it's very hard to separate that that mother and child for you know the 24 to 72 hours that that test might take, um, so it's 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 quite hard to sort of. I always say, look, this is what we recommend. You know, do the best you can around hand washing. Try and clean surfaces down if you're going to be in, um, you know, a, a shared space with others. Try and just have a mask on, but. You know, the, and this is the balance I always find that it is, you know, in an ideal world, the mother could go away for a week and stay in a hotel until the swap result comes back. But at the same time, she'll, whatever cold she probably has will probably just go to children anyway because that's, you know, the biggest rate of, uh, rate of transmission happens in the home from family to family just because you're, you know, you're close to each other, so it's going to happen. There have also been examples, though, of people that are COVID-positive cohabitating that for some reason don't pass it on. Um, but, you know, there's like this, it's been happening so far, there's lots of anomalies. Um, what I, I think is really important is coming down to communication. I listened to something very rec uh, recently this week around Taiwan, around how they're communicating. And they're, they're probably one of the best countries in the world in terms of response to COVID. And one of the ways that they uh, helped respond to some of the stuff Josh was saying around, the, you know, the 5G and all these other rumours that come out was... They have this um, approach called humour versus rumour or rumour versus humour where they any rumours that come out, they chuck a, a humour to it. So they've actually got, a, I think, of a group of about 100 people with professional comedians that, you know, find all these things coming up in memes and, and, and basically instead of taking them down and saying, no, you're wrong, they'll flip it on its head and go, well, this is actually, let's, let's see the funny side of this. Or inversely, what they've started to do as well as 
someone will post uh, you know, an article about 5G or something like that, but then what they do is they'll make sure there's an edit to, to the bottom saying, well, this is the person that wrote up their credentials. You know, they, the actual original source where they've got all this from was from something from Russia or something from China. And you know, if it's from China and Taiwan, there's obviously significance internally whether you would trust that source, even though it might have been posted by someone in Taiwanese. So I, I found that way of looking at how to you know, translate that best practice policy, which I know Josh is really focused and working on, into something practical is so important. Like Josh was saying, is looking at that communication, but doing it, I guess, looking at how that communication not happening, maybe not press briefings. You know, most people probably don't pay attention to these press briefings, you know. It's just, but how do you do it really effectively and, and get the message, the key messages across? Mm, interesting. And Joshua, what, what are your thoughts on that in terms of the practicality and, yeah, and best the, practice? The golden question really, this is, really, is really what it is. Mm. Uh, to answer it, I think that it's important to learn to see what other countries are doing and use them as case studies. So we do that all the time. Um, to see what's working for particular nations. So just two case studies quickly, that is what I to, to present. The first is New Zealand. Now, New Zealand, as we know, have uh, recently eradicated the disease in, from, from community bank, um, from community sourced uh, transfers of infection. They still have individuals flying into the country with the disease, but as for the, um, the standard citizen, um, it's, it's gone, it's eradicated. They suffered greatly by the quick, swift response um, and have, uh, maintaining one of the strictest uh, lockdown protocols and procedures around, around the world. Uh, they lost 30%, uh, 30 in, in terms of understanding practicality, 37% they, uh, they, of their GDP was wiped off, um, was wiped off the market. So if you look at that, how does that translate into their death tolls? They lost 22 people um, of the population of 4.8 million, which translates to something like it's, it's uh, 10 to the minus 605. They lost a very, very small percentage of their population. If we look to Sweden now, Sweden maintained uh, a stance of herd immunity. The resistance of a spread of a, of a which defines the ability for uh, the spread of a contagious disease within a population that results in a sufficiently high proportion of um, individuals becoming immune to the disease um, with or without vaccination. That was the, t it's a, it's a, it's a technique that is utilized by, um, by some public health officials. Sweden was one of the only countries that decided to go down that pathway. They lost uh, 5,000 people of a population of, of 10.23. They only lost 8% of their GDP because they mostly stayed open. Um, that's 0.0005%. However, if in, in, in comparing the two countries, that's a factor of, of, of 100 um, in terms of, uh, in considering the death toll difference um, when, when maintaining population, um, when considering their population. They lost a huge number of lives. Uh, in my opinion, uh, they made a mistake. Um, they made, they, they took, it failed, herd immunity failed, um, and too many of their elderly community members died needlessly. Um, it's a strong call, but it's one that is maintained by most of my colleagues. Um, why were we successful? It's important to understand that to answer the question. Firstly, apart from our geography, we literally have a moat. It's almost like Australia was designed, <laughs> and, you know, countries like Australia and New Zealand were designed to withstand, um, you know, a pandemic. Our low population density. Sydney, the most populated, uh, populated city in, in Australia, has a density of 407 people per square kilometre. New York, that number is 38,000. So it is much easier, it was much easier for us to have maintained social distance, distancing. Our, mm -hmm. our infrastructure uh, in terms of our healthcare system, it's fourth best in the world. Um, and easy, and you know, um, for that reason, due, due, due to um, infrastructure, um, it was easy for us to self-isolate. So with that in mind, we're considering, you know, balancing um, best practice with practicality. This delicate balance must be led with health outcomes first. We as a nation have decided that. Um, that that is what we should prioritize. So sacrificing what can be sacrificed, working from home, maintaining social distancing, because as mentioned, it's easy for us to do. Um, using face masks, the, uh, the WHO recently re um, released information, updated information about the, the use of face masks, which, which suggests it may be uh, protective in nature for uh, and useful for 
uh, our senior members in high density areas such as shopping centers and on public transport. Um, these items are all done to stop chains of transmission, which is, which is key. That's what we want to be able to do. Um, so items that can be sacrificed easily with minimal uh, you know, effect on the economy, items like what I've just mentioned should be prioritized. Um, and then under that primary, uh, uh, those potential uh, policy, policies that can be implemented, underneath that is you know, a re-lockdown if we need it upon a resurgence or a, or a prominent second wave, which will probably come next year if a vaccine is not uh, produced for us. So those are, those are just some thoughts. Yeah, it's interesting to see at least, you know, one country try out the herd immunity approach. I'm, I read an article, I think it was from a couple of pandemic experts at the Melbourne Business School talking about those two approaches between, you know, the herd immunity and just the kind of lockdown approach. And that a, a lot of it comes down to just ethical decisions and working out uh, with COVID-19 that it mainly affects, you know, older people and is it, uh, we need to hone in on that specifically is that older people and vulnerable people and we're sort of shortening their lifespan and and you know is there an ethical thing around that versus you know everyone suffers from the, the lockdown versus um, you know the, the herd immunity but it is interesting to hear how damaging that herd immunity approach has been in Sweden and um, so that's that's fascinating we had a question actually come through um, kind of on that, you know, what is the appropriate response? Is it tightly regulated control or leaving it to individuals to self-regulate? And um, I think in Australia, we had uh, those examples of, you know, we had pretty tight controls in the states that maybe differed a little bit, but we still had people using common sense and then people breaking the rules, uh, you know, down at Bondi and Manly on those nice days we had back in April. Mm -hmm. um, is there, do you think there's going to be a best practice that comes out of this as a result of that? So we, we've seen different countries do different approaches. Is there going to be kind of, you know, world's best practice and this is how it's done? Or is it, does there have to be some degree of customization to a particular area based on some of those things you said, Joshua, around population density and, and even down to the state level, allowing them to do what's best for them based on how they're going to be experiencing it? Yeah, sure. It's, it's chains of transmission. That's what everything boils down to. In, in areas of you know, high population density, a shopping center, it is, it is those chains that, uh, it, is, it is a breeding ground for chains. So in answering your question, a best practice in terms of you know, that 1.5 meters, that is set in place because evidence shows that that, um, that distance proves 81% successful. The, the Lancet recently produced an article suggesting that it has an 81% protection rate for individuals. It's having that distance is almost like wearing a face mask. It is a best practice because of, um, and, and it is, it is evidence-led. And for us, it's easier to control than say, forcing people to wear face masks than going, than going home, than, than, than being forced to stay at home. I think that, and, and, and from that first part of your question, regulation, we uh, surrendered our, our you know, rights to have people over quite easily. And it, it was something that allowed us to, I think the population as a, as a whole saw the benefit of, of, of relinquishing our, you know, our, our rights um, momentarily and for a short, a short duration, whilst yeah, other nations weren't able to, uh, to see that, whether it be due to their past experiences, um, you know, the, the particular wording of their laws, um, or their or their actual their cultural preferences, you know, uh, the concept that they have the right to get sick plays stronger in various you know uh, uh, capitalist nations as opposed to other ones that maintain a communal understanding of of helping the other. Um, it's, it's a culturally, uh, it comes down to the cultural preferences of nations on how to answer, on how to go about answering that, I think. Um, that's why community engagement is particularly important. As I mentioned in my first question, the concept of, 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 of working with all stakeholders involved, I think would have meant a much uh, more peaceful, you know, and uh, adhered policy program. Um, across, you know, especially in those nations where compliance was low, Italy, the States, um, Spain, countries like that. Yep. Great. 
Thanks, Joshua. We've got a few comments and questions. Um, so Michael, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'd love to tackle some of these. Um, this one is actually, I think, a bit of a, uh, might be a comment from Peter Young. The tone is that COVID is under control. The Economist is reporting that stage one is increasing in 75% of countries. It's looking really bad in Asia and South America where there are huge populations, poverty, a lack of PPE and medical facilities. So from a world perspective, increasing COVID unemployment and its effect on the world economy is still unknown. Um, sort of take that as a bit of a comment, but Joshua or Toby, do you have any comments on that? Any of those statistics? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Is it, I guess the question we could take from it is, it, is it under control or are we far from having it under control? And there's, there's a lot more uncertainty ahead. Yeah, you're, um, you're right, Peter, in the sense that it's uh, country, various continents and, and countries present a different story. Almost every country is unique in terms of their, um, the prevalence of resurgences. And, um, we shouldn't say second wave yet. It's too soon in any country for us to call you know, a spike, a second wave. That's the first thing I just like to correct whenever I speak about this, because people, that's been thrown around the media a bit. Um, at this point, any spike in cases is called a resurgence. It's still part of the first wave. Um, I think for more, it's not under control yet because we don't have a vaccine. Control, in defining control, it is the capacity to decide when, how, and where the disease will be. Um, we can't control that yet. And so we have to still maintain, we still have to adhere to these social practices that we don't have, that we don't usually have to. Um, so it is not under control yet per se. It is just, we have, we, it is maintained in, uh, in Australia's case within the, 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 the realm of, of, uh, of control where we haven't lost complete control. It's, uh, it's, the word control is very vague. Um, and so I would say that we have been able to stop it from getting worse, uh, but, we, but if we were to adhere, at, drop all of our social, um, our public health measures, it would once again very quickly fall out of control. Mm. Good answer. Toby, do you have anything to add to that? Or? Um, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say. I, I was speaking to a friend of mine that's in the States that's actually had a similar experience um, to me. To me. She works in emergency and, and doesn't actually, or hasn't actually been that busy. She's in uh, California, I think outside Santa Cruz or something like that. And she said, you know, most of her shifts have been not busy. It's more her county has done very well in terms of controlling COVID, where the betrayal that you get from the media is that the whole of the US is infected everywhere. So I think we need to be careful when we band together these generalities around countries and, and look at the, the, it's a bit more nuanced and a bit more um, specific. So it, it, it is very hard to say. I think what I've learned from this and listening to a lot of different commentators on various different aspects, whether it be economic, whether it be health, whether it be social, is that to predict and plan the future or to make judgments on the future, I think is, is very, very sort of reckless in a way because we, we should have learned by now that we, we can't, you know, a prediction outside of next week or four weeks away is, you know, pretty, pretty unreliable. So, uh, uh, yeah. Sounds like sort of proceed with caution is the, is the mm -hmm. best way forward there, given the uncertainty. So I, another I think, question. Yep. Or Go, I think be prepared. I think prepare be prepared. for all potential circumstances. Think about the future. I'm not saying don't think about the future, but... I think when you be ready to, you know, be agile and move. And, and I think that's what, you know, my, my background and trainings always showed me, you know, prepare for the scenarios when it doesn't happen or good. And I think that's what Australia has done quite well is we've got good standards of swabbing. We've got good standards of PPE. We've got good measures in terms of capacity with our health system. Now the biggest challenge is getting people back to somewhat of a normal society. So things will go on and, you know, I've been thinking about the, the, the risk of COVID, for the health risk of COVID is now less than the risk of, I guess, the economy and all the other social issues. Now that is becoming a bigger health risk to the general population than COVID itself. Mm. Yeah, an interesting question actually has come through from Graham Davis, which on similar uh, topic to that one, Toby. So 
an age group that has been impacted is the 15 to 30 year olds, education interrupted and unemployment and so forth, particularly I imagine, you know, we've heard a lot around casuals and people in those entry level non-essential roles, I suppose. Uh, it is likely they will take longer to get back on their feet post COVID. It is the age group for which suicide is the largest cause of death currently. Um, so do you see this demographic, uh, you know, one that's at risk going forward? Joshua uh, or Toby? Sure, sure, yeah, I do. I, um, yes, uh, is the short answer. I, I do believe that um, as we begin to relinquish ourselves from the initial onslaught of, of, of emotional distress, um, it, this, is, this will remain for a while. Um, that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to have seen the government recently devote, I think it was around a $50 million mark, $48 million to the, um, the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic Response Plan. So it is, uh, there has been proactive action taken that is, that is evidence driven. As you mentioned, it is known that, is, it, um, that the suicide rate, for example, is, the, um, is most prominent in that demographic and that age group. Um, I think that it's important to note as we um, as we go back slowly to person to person contact, maintaining those those uh, and allowing time and space for those harder conversations. How are you going? How are you feeling? You know, are you okay? Day should become an everyday occurrence. Um, really allowing us to get back in touch with each other because it it, it has a, so, a prominent social effect on us. Social health, yeah, and prioritizing. I mean, Toby, this is a hard one for us. I think prioritizing. Uh, you know, just physical health over social health is never an easy call to make, but it's one that, that public health officials have had to make um, in, in, in the short term, but it does come at a cost. Um, and so that I think is something we'll have to watch um, carefully in the coming months and years. I, I think within that age group, it's, it's, COVID will have a risk. I mean, have, have an uh, impact on these, on that age group, but also I think the, the bigger, impacts will probably come from technology from all these other factors you know how how quickly technology is changing things from you know online dating to you know how we've now interacting with each other i i kind of feel that those covid will cause an impact on that you know uh, the question was more around sort of suicidality but i i kind of have a feeling that you know this online world and the social constructs will actually have a much bigger like josh was saying a much bigger uh cause and an issue to, to this age group. Mm. Great. Another uh, question actually was another good one from Graham, um, which is, I think is an interesting one given the fields that the two of you work in and who you're exposed to. Graham says one of the positive outcomes since the beginning of COVID-19 has been an increased respect for an acknowledgement of the importance and part played by science and researchers in determining policy and providing information to the public. You know, we've seen those chief medical officers front and center in front of the cameras, which has been amazing in the government saying, we're taking advice from these guys, we're listening to these guys. And it gives that credibility around their policy decisions. So do you think that recognition is going to continue? And I, I mean, I wonder as well, will it expand into other fields as well? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, it's, a, it's uh, I would say that, um, this outcome has, I wouldn't say the word positive. I would feel that, I feel like it's been extreme. We, I, we've seen, yes, uh, policy being shaped by, mostly um, by governments uh, who have drawn expertise and recommendations from their scientists um, and researchers. However, as I mentioned before, we have significant pockets of society that have gone in the other direction, uh, who have accused, uh, and uh, especially at, the, at that, um, public health perspective at the policy level. Um, I, I, I've received multiple calls, both in my position as executive manager um, and from the perspective of a, um, acting as a public health advisor for a few different um, businesses. It's been um, very trouble, tr troubling to hear that uh, people do, will actually hold on to this tribalistic tendency and be absolutely convinced that we are wanting to, you know, to hurt them, to, to bring harm to their, their family and their community. Um, it's, but having said that, on the whole, there has been, um, uh, yeah, I suppose, prominence, uh, an increase in prominence. I'd like to think that it will continue because, at least in this country, because it worked. 
touch wood <laughs> always. Um, so far, we've we've seen a, a, a very positive, highly um, as close to a best case scenario as I think we can have asked for. That that language is not to be used widely because unfortunately we lost 102 people. Um, you know, it, it's it's always going to be a, a loss for us, but. Um, it's a community based, we, we Australians maintain the cultural tendency to look out for one another. Mateship is embedded in many elements of our government and, and military um, mantras and mandates, um, camaraderie and, and uh, you know, helping um, give it, the fair go concept reigns true in our, uh, in, in our country. Um, so I think, in, I think for us, it will, it will continue um, as, as they understand, as, Evidence has now shown, we've got the, 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 the evidence of the past few months showing that science has, has worked in our favor um, and just evidence-based decisions. I think I've drawn from, you know, I, I never have an opinion on these things. I, I, if I get a question, I will go and research the answer. Um, and that, that seems to um, have paid off for us so far. And I hope that recognition does, that, that, that way of scientifically-based unemotional thinking does continue. That's a smart way to do it, I think, Joshua. Um, Graham and Angus, I know we've just hit the five o'clock mark. Do we need to wrap up or can we hit another couple of questions? I think there are one or two, but I know people are probably going to have to drop off and do various things. Um, we, you can keep going. No problems here. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I think you know, another 10 minutes, I think. There's some very good questions here in the Q&A section, which I'd like to get through. And a couple right. of people that I know, so be interested yes. to hear your response. Yeah, fantastic. So another one uh, we've got from uh, where were you? Where are we? Stuart Clegg. So, what is your view of the way in which some countries, particularly the UK, USA, and Brazil, individual freedom is being privileged over community health? What are your thoughts on that? I know you touched on some of this briefly around, you know, the, the cultural differences and, you know, we talked about best practice versus realities and there's mental health impacts of social distancing and people have, I think even in Australia have made logical, rational, common sense decisions around, you know, bending the rules perhaps to, to avoid other negative consequences and mm. things like that. Um, but what's your view around that, that cultural thing around individual freedom versus privilege? Is that a kind of ethical and value-based decision we as a country need to make as well in Australia? I, I think from those sorts of countries, it's, it's a lot around leadership. I mean, particularly Brazil and USA, uh, you know, it's, it's leaders. It's someone that is, is sort of, there's been so many examples of how, how, you, you can lead or how you need to lead in, in this pandemic. Um, and I think it's a collective thing, like Joshua said before, that there is a point where you sometimes have to sacrifice and give up some of your own personal freedoms for the benefit of the, the greater community. Um, and I, I guess if it's people are willing to do that, if, if it's a short term and they see that there's a value to it, but if, if not, then it's, it's a bit of a, you know, it, it, it may not be the, the best, best thing going forward. Um, you know, the, the, it, it, it is very different to each country. I, I was, one of the things I was listening to recently was saying that the five of the best countries, top, top five countries in terms of, you know, reacting to COVID, out of four out of the five were actually female, the leaders. Mm. And then inversely, the worst five countries, five out of, uh, four out of the five were actually men that were leaders. Not saying, you know, this is, this is not drawing on saying that this is the universal, but it was, it was certainly quite an interesting distinction, having uh, females that are maybe a little bit more agile and have that human perspective, which is actually probably needed in a pandemic like this, that actually looks at things in a bit, bit more, like I was talking about before, in a broader way, that it's not just about a death toll or about how things we used to be, but how things should be in the future and having that holistic, empathetic way yeah. I, I would I would agree with that completely, Toby. Um, it is it is leadership, and it's also leaders uh, directing the means in which they draw their policy formulation from uh, and the policy development. Um, I mean, not to mention the fact of adding fuel to fire. I'm not going to talk about one country, but I'll talk about the other one. Brazil. We saw their president marching in the streets. Um, 
during during the lockdown protests because he, he didn't have the power to uh, you know allow the, uh, force the states to uh, uh, release and, and relax them so he joined it was very unfortunate um, I think that yes in my studies we it was wonderful to come across different health it, you can actually look back if you were to go back to pre-COVID times and assess the uh, the mechanisms of individual countries' healthcare systems, you can actually gain some insight into how a country ha would have how, um, how they have responded. Um, USA maintains, you know, one of the most expensive healthcare systems in the world because they take the, um, they take their uh, their uh, the cultural uh, abstractions of build your own wealth, live your own dreams, work hard, get be, be able to afford health insurance. Um, Etc., and that is in that way completely individualized, separatist thinking, which um, separatist thinking, which renders community initiatives mostly ineffective. Unfortunately, um, that's why uni universal healthcare to this day has failed in the states. Um, whilst for us, the conception of community improvement holistically, as well, I think is. Um, a reason that we can enjoy the, the privilege of universal health care. Um, it's a mindset it's an, and it's, yeah, it's a cultural persuasion. Um, it's it's a, the general thought processes and um, uh, it, it's a characteristic, I think, of a nation by nation to maintain one's own health versus the health of others around us. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if we're going to see as a fallout from some of this, you know, we talked about some of the unintended consequences socially and like mental health, even domestic violence and, and things like that. And I wonder if we'll be able to quantify those impacts to see that sort of balance. And, you know, you would hope it's not as bad as some of the negative impacts of the virus because the virus impacts being huge and terrible in places like America. So you would think it wouldn't be as bad, but in the long term, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. And do we see what those, all of those impacts of it have been? Um, so another question from Howard Gwynn, how long do you think people will be able to keep up social distancing and hand washing? They seem to be key strategies for keeping some control over spread, but how long will people keep doing this? Will we get tired of these practices? Social contact is a basic human need. Good question. Thanks, Howard. What do you think, Toby and Josh? Toby? Is Toby coming across as... Um, yeah, I think we're, we're losing you a bit, Toby. Do you want to jump in, Josh? I'll, I'll take it, I'll take it. Well, I think there will be long-term changes. <laughs> so, okay, I'll take it while your internet is in it, um, go through that black spot, Toby. Um, uh, Howard, it's a, it's a good question. I would just like to think that uh, hand-washing, firstly, is a is a... A practice that is maintained throughout one's life, <laughs> just as a, as a general practice. Um, Unless you're my kids. My <laughs> that's kids it. Struggle yeah. with it. Like, no matter how much I try and enforce that one, my kids uh, yeah. don't seem to grasp it. I have to keep monitoring them. I actually gave um, I actually gave a, a lesson to 200 kids in um, Western Sydney last year. Very, very fortunately, about infectious disease control. Um, and it was uh, about how to ha wash your hands properly, and we put slime in their hands. Um, and we gave each other, they gave each other handshakes to show how far the slime would actually travel, um, and then show, show us hand practicing, um, right. uh, hand washing practices. But uh, how long? It's a bit of a piece of string question. Um, how long it, it will go for as long as, as the stats tell us to. But in terms of getting tired of them, I don't think so. Howard, I think that on average we will get used to them. I actually have, um, I went shopping a couple of days ago and I didn't even think about the fact that I was standing on, on crosses. Um, it's, it will be the norm until a vaccine comes. It, it has to be. Becoming tired of them will, will lead to, um, to, you know, to mental health stress, uh, stress, stress and other mental health related um, issues. So I think it is a question of community engagement on how we can keep up the message from the public health perspective and, and, um, and health promotion. Um, social distancing is now as important as washing hands. Like it's, it's, 
not something that we are used to. We've always been told to wash our hands. It's a norm. But, but now social distancing, 1.5 meters, it's, it's the same as, as you know, not, not coughing onto someone. It's, it's, the, it's the equivalent now of covering your mouth when you sneeze. That's what we used to say. And now it's don't go closer to anyone at once. So it's, we have to get used to it. It's, it, it's, it's just essential for us to ensure that we don't, that we break these chains of transmission. But I, do, I agree, I definitely, when I mentioned before, social health is incredibly important and it is a basic human need. Hugging a family now is, is something that, and I think our close friends, someone that we see regularly at, at this point, I won't say hi, neither he nor there, but you know, it's, uh, it's a really, we're in a very tough, very gray area right now. I, under, I, I um, if you're frustrated, I, I definitely can, can sympathize and empathize. I definitely miss the, the high-fiving and handshakes and hugging <laughs> myself. I'm, I'm bit of an extrovert there. Um, it's 10 past five folks. So I think we've answered all of the questions that have come through the Q and A. It's been a great session, really insightful. Thank you, Toby and Joshua. And thank you for everyone who attended and has um, put some great comments from all the different places in Australia and great questions as well. So thank you for that.